the political position of the netherworld. The netherworld is a straightforward protest against the harm of the prevailing economic system towards the destitute in society. There's very little specific engagement with higher financial and social orders within the netherworld. It's really quite restricted. We see the solicitors um, who are the administrators of the fortune that Michael Snowden has inherited from his son. Their proceedings, their way of transacting business, strike the reader as arcane and not terribly straightforward. One of the solicitors is quite clearly duplicitous and quite clearly in professional breach of codes of confidentiality that should pertain to working within the legal prof profession. There are a few other hints about the financial and socially higher orders, uh, the oblique references to a group of people who would wear the kind of expensive jewellery that Sydney is engaged in making. There are also a number of references to double standards in society, how girls receive a different education um, if they come from wealthier backgrounds, they won't need to go out to earn their living. Double standards with regard to consumption of alcohol, double standards with regard to the animal spirits um, perhaps uh, of young men, men of the upper class are more tolerated in their high spirits, their antics, than men coming from the labouring class. And there are con there's a constant reference to the netherworld as being a different location where different standards and a whole different outlook and expectation of life prevail from another echelon of society that we really, during the course of this novel, do not properly enter. Sydney, at one point, he's speaking to John Hewitt about his daughter Clara, about John Hewitt's daughter Clara, says, we are working people, we are. We are the lower orders. Our girls have to go out and get their livings. We teach them the best we can, and the devil knows they are got, they've got examples enough of misery and ruin before their eyes to help them to keep straight. Rich people can take care of their daughters as much as they like. They can treat them like children till they're married. People of our kind can't do that, and it has to be faced. So, in that oblique way, uh, we come into contact with another level of society in the netherworld, uh, but it's very little put specifically before us. There's another aspect of the netherworld and the degradation and exploitation of poor people that implies that this kind of behaviour, this subjugation of others, is integral to human nature. People are not only taken advantage of in the netherworld by prevailing economic circumstances um, or by people who somehow are invested in or invested with greater power than they are inherently from the start. We see exploitation of, of people in this level of society that we're looking at in Clarkenwell by people who belong to that society. So for example, Clem Peckover, 
is extremely cruel and very exploitative towards Jane Snowden as when Jane Snowden is working as the, the family drudge. We see that Joe Snowden, uh, when he comes into possession of the fortune himself, treats his daughter really um, quite badly. He keeps her at the, the lowest possible level that he can sustain her at um, without invoking st strong moral criticism. He doesn't keep her at the level that he could afford to keep her at. He really does maintain her at a very, very frugal level. Uh, he's selfish and he wants all of the fortune for himself. Michael Snowden as well uh, exploits Jane. He exploits the submissiveness of her nature, which in many respects is as a result of the exploitation, the degradation, the emotional uh, deprivation that she has suffered during the course of her life. She has no sense of self-worth. In other words, she has no confidence in her capacity to be loved. And therefore she conforms to what anybody asks of her um, in, a, in order to find acceptance. And that is true as well of her acquiescence to uh, Michael's demands that she give up essentially her own life. She give up, gives up the prospect of uh, becoming uh, a mother, um, of living a life which expresses her own interests, her own desires, and simply follows the fairly fanatical ideas about distributing philanthropy that, that Michael has. Bob Hewitt, as well, in his own way, is an oppressor. He oppresses Pennyloaf within their marriage. He's violent, he is denigrating, So, it's not simply that the, it's not simply that problems lie within the structure of society, an unfair structure. They, the problems lie really with humanity. We see, as well, um, at an institutional level um, within the. Um, the social level um, exploitation of people who are struggling to survive. When Penny Loaf, for example, visits the pawnbrokers, uh, she it takes in some clothing and, well, what is it, he asked, rubbing his tongue along his upper lip before and after speaking. This is the assistant at the pawnbrokers. Three and six, please, sir. He rolled up the things again with a practised turn of the hand and said indifferently, glancing towards another box, 18 pence. Oh, sir, this is Pennyloaf speaking. We had two shillings on the skirt not so long ago, pleaded Pennyloaf with a subservient voice. Make it two shillings, please do, sir. The man paid no attention. He was curling his moustache and exchanging a smile of intelligence with his counter companion, with respect to a piece of business the latter had in hand. Of a sudden he turned and said sharply, Well, are you going to take it or not? Penny Loaf sighed and nodded. Got a penny, he asked. No. He fetched a cloth, rolled the articles in it very tightly and pinned them up. Then he made a ticket and duplicate, handing his pen with facile flourish and having blotted the, the little piece of card on a box of sand, he threw it to the customer. It's a grim, it's a grim picture, um, as has been discussed in the, the other sections of this um, item. The book is ultimately quite pessimistic.
the um, critic uh, Frederick Farrar um, observes the author of the book of which the t of which of which the title stands at the head of this paper has little or nothing to impress upon us as to the nature of the remedy. In one passage he says, with unconcealed irony, to humanise the multitude two things are necessary, two things of the simplest kind conceivable. In the first place you must effect an entire change of economic conditions, a preliminary step of which every tyro will recognise the easiness. Then you must bring to bear on the new order of things the constant influence of music. As Frederick Farrar says, this leaves us terribly at sea. And I think the book does leave us terribly at sea. There aren't any solutions put forward. The purpose of the book seems to be to generate sympathy, to generate awareness of a situation that does require a remedy, and probably the only remedy that is possible to find is coming from lots and lots of different quarters, reform in lots and lots of different quarters, gradually amalgamating into something that will shift the situation.